Okay. Hi. Hi, grade 10. So we are already finally in book three. This is like the most action-packed section of Tales of City. So brace yourselves. Okay, so now we are at we I'm assigned with a chat the even numbers, so we will continue with that. So now let's do the grindstone. So chapter book three, chapter two, the grindstone. So I want you to read um, until it says from the streets beyond the high wall. Okay, so give pause and pause. From the streets beyond the high wall and the strong gate, there came the usual night hum of the city, with now and then an indescribable ring in it, weird and unearthly, as if some unwanted sounds of a terrible nature were going up to heaven. So, Mr. Lorry was in Paris, and then the revolution was going on, and then this is the thought that passed through Mr. Lorry's head. Thank God, said Mr. Lorry, clasping his hands, that no one dear to me is in this dreadful town. Watch kahibao tonight may he have mercy on all who are in danger soon afterwards the bell at the great gate sounded and he thought they have come back and sat listening but there was no loud ir eruption into the courtyard as he had expected and he heard the gate clash again and all was quiet the nervousness and dread that were upon him inspired that vague uneasiness respecting the bank which a great change would naturally awaken with such feelings roused it was well guarded and he got up to go among the trusty people who were watching it when his door suddenly opened and two figures rushed in at the sight which he fell back in amazement. Lucy and her father, oh my gosh, nangapas na, nangapas na ang duha. Lucy and her father, Lucy with her arms stretched out to him and with that old look of earnestness so concentrated and intensified that it seemed as though it had been stamped upon her face expressly to give force and power to it on this one passage of her life. What is this? cried Mr. Lorry, breathless and confused. What is the matter? Lucy, Manette, what has happened? What has brought you here? What is it? With a look fixed upon him in her paleness and wildness, she panted out in his arms, imploring, Oh, my dear friend, my husband. Your husband, Lucy? Charles. What of Charles? Here. Here in Paris? Has been here some days, three or four. I don't know how many. I can't collect my thoughts. An errand of generosity brought him here unknown to us. He was stopped at the barrier and sent to prison. The old man uttered an irrepressible cry almost at the same moment. The beg of a of the great the beg of the great gate rang again, and a noise of feet and voices came pouring into the courtyard. The mob. What is that noise? said the doctor, turning towards the window. Don't look, cried Mr. Lorry. Don't look out, Manette, for your life, don't touch the blind. The doctor turned with his hand upon the fastening of the window and said with a cool, cool blue smile bold smile, My dear friend, I have a charmed life in the city. I have been a Bastille prisoner. There is no patriot in Paris. In Paris? In France, who, knowing me to have been a prisoner at the Bastille, would touch me, except to overwhelm me with embraces and carry me in triumph. My old pain has given me a power that has brought us through the barrier and gained us news of Charles there and brought us here. I knew it would be so. I knew I could help Charles out of this danger. I told Lucy so. What is that noise? His hand was again upon the door, the window. So Mr. Manette was like, don't worry about me. Paris knows me and knows me well that I had been a prisoner of the Bastille. And I know that when they recognize me, I will not be harmed. The only hands that will be laid upon me will be embraces. So the doctor was very confident. And in a sense, he was very happy that that happened. The Bastille thing happened to him so that now he can exercise his influence over the people and maybe get Charles back. Don't look, cried Mr. Lorry, absolutely desperate. No, Lucy, my dear, nor you. He got his arm round her and held her. Don't be so terrified, my love. I solemnly swear to you that I know of no harm having happened to Charles, that I had no suspicion even of his being in this fatal place. What prison is he in? La Force. La Force, Lucy, my child, if ever you were brave and serviceable in your life, and you were always both, you will compose yourself now to do exactly as I bid you. For more depends upon it than you can think, or I can say. There is no help for you in any action on your part tonight. 
you cannot possibly stir out. I say this because what I must bid you to do for Charles' sake is the hardest thing to do of all. You must instantly be obedient, still, and quiet. You must let me put you in a room at the back here. You must leave your father and me alone for two minutes. And as there are life and death in the world, you must not delay. They're telling her to stay in the room and be quiet. Do not make a stir. I will be submissive to you. I see in your face that you know I can do nothing else than this. I know you are true. Good girl, Lucy. The old man kissed her and hurried her into his room and to his room and turned the key. Then came up, came back hurrying, came hurrying back to the doctor and opened the window and partly opened the blind and put his hand upon the doctor's arm and looked out with him into the courtyard. Looked out upon a throng of men. So in the courtyard, there was a throng. A throng is a crowd of men. Now, when I want you to read all the way until all this was seen in a moment. Okay, so pause. All this was seen in a moment as the vision of a drowning man or of any human creature at any very great pass could see a world if it were there. They drew back from the window and the doctor looked for explanation in his friend's ashy face. They are, Mr. Lorry whispered in words, glancing fearfully around at the locked room, murdering the prisoners. If you are sure of what you say, if you really have the power you think you have, as I believe you have, make yourself known to these devils and get taken to La Force. It may be too late, I don't know, but let it not be a minute later. Dr. Manette pressed his hand, hastened bareheaded out of the room, and was in the courtyard when Mr. Lorry regained the blind. His streaming white hair, his remarkable face, and the impetuous confidence of his manner, as he put the weapons aside like water, carried him in an instant to the heart of the concourse of the stone. For a few minutes, there was a pause and a hurry and a murmur and the unintelligible sound of his voice. And then Mr. Lorry saw him, surrounded by all and in the midst of a line of 20 men, all linked shoulder to shoulder, a hand to shoulder, hurried out with cries of, Live the Bastille prisoner! Help for the Bastille prisoner! Kindred in La Force! See? So his power was like, everybody was like, yeah, let's help him, let's help him, let's help him, this kindred who is now in La Force, okay? Room for the Bastille prisoner in front there. Save the prisoner Evermond at La Force. And a thousand answering shouts. He closed the lattice again with a fluttering heart, closed the window and the curtain, hastened to Lucy and told her that her father was assisted by the people and gone in search of her husband. He found her child Miss Pross with her, but it never occurred to him to be surprised by their appearance until a long time afterwards, when he sat watching them in such quiet as the night knew. Lucy had by that time fallen into a stupor on the floor at his feet, clinging to his hand. Miss Pross had laid the child down on his own bed, and her head had gradually fallen on the pillow beside her pretty charge. Oh, the long, long night when the moans of the, um, with the moans of the poor wife and oh, the long, long night, with no return of her father and no tidings. Twice more in the darkness, the bell at the great gate sounded, and the eruption was repeated. The grindstone whirled and sputtered. What is that? cried Lucy. Um, affrighted. Hush, the soldier's swords are sharpened there, said Mr. Lorry. The place is national property now, and used as a kind of armory, my love. Twice more in all, but the last spell of work was feeble and fitful. Soon afterwards, the day began to dawn. And he saw Don, <laughs> and he softly detached himself from the clasping hand and cautiously looked out again. A man so besmeared that he might have been sorely wounded, a sorely wounded soldier creeping back to consciousness on a field of slain was rising from the pavement by the side of the grindstone and looking about him with a vacant air. Shortly, the sworn out murderer decried in the imperfect light one of the carriages of Monsignor and staggering to that gorgeous vehicle, climbed in at the door and shut himself to take his rest of its dainty cushions. The great grindstone earth had turned when Mr. Lorry looked out again. The sun was red on the courtyard, but the lesser grindstone stood alone there in the calm morning air, with a red upon it that the sun had never given and would never take away. Okay, so I think the, the, the main point of this chapter was the great influence that Dr. Manette had in Paris and how much 
the citizens respected him, that the citizens knew of his value and knew of his contribution and knew of his patriotism. So I will see you for the, I will see you again. My next chapter is Come in Storm. Okay, so bye.